This is Meriden Grange, number 29, 1885 to 2015. The 130th anniversary presentation researched and prepared by Robert A. Charbonneau. For lecturer, Cynthia K. Charbonneau presented on September 12th, 2015. Welcome to our fair. I'm Bob Charbonneau, president of Meriden Grange Number 29. We've put together a presentation on the past 130 years on Meriden Grange's history. As we go through Meriden Grange's history, we will present some key events. Founded March 27, 1885, Meriden Grange was organized by State Deputy Sherman Kimberly and Mortimer Whitehead of New Jersey. The first meeting was held at the J.T. Pomeroy House in the area of Pomeroy and Ives Avenues. A large number of the attendees were farmers and their wives from within a mile radius on the east side of Meriden, Connecticut. This was the first agricultural organization formed after the Civil War specifically for farmers. Thirty-two member, Meriden residents accepted charter membership. The form here was signed by all and was filed with the National Grange office. This is a photocopy of that document from the National Grange. Of the 32, 14 who attended were the wives of the men who signed up. George B. Murdoch was appointed Master and G. H. Beckel as Secretary at their first meeting. A side note, the Grange number is appointed after the charter request is received by the National Grange. As an example of one of the farmers who joined in 1885, here's a photo of the J.H. Yale Farm, circa 1890. We acquired a past master's jewel engraved with David Yale's name and the year 1919 from eBay. When the seller found out this was going back to its original range, she gave us this photograph along with its date. The little boy on the left is David Yale and grows up to be master of Meriden Grange at the end of World War I. More items were gleaned from eBay to piece together historical information about how Meriden Grange members went on outings. On August 24th, 1897, on the steamer John H. Starin, Members took an excursion tour of Long Island Sound from New Haven to Glen Island near New York City and back. Uh, concerning uh, turn of the century agricultural activities, this is a picture of a massive agricultural display denoting the trains su supplying these goods. The phrase on the side of the closest train car says, the world demands our goods. Around the beginning of the 20th century, here's an example of participation in parades. This is an agricultural float presented by Meriden Grange. Probably one of the largest examples of Grange camaraderie is a joint picnic between members of their families of Wallingford and Meriden Grange. This was held at Spruce Glen Falls in Meriden, next to the Meriden Wallingford town line on August 4th, 1910. Pictured here is both sides of a postcard commemorating the event and given to the attendees and their families. Janet Howler from Wallingford Grange supplied us photos and items from the event. This is a group photo of the picnic with most of everyone in the frame. I actually took a magnifying glass and counted everyone in the photo. On the far center background of the photo is a stage with the American flag of the period. The inset at the lower right is the same photo of Spruce Glen Falls. A poem was dedicated for this picnic. I would like to play you a recording by Terry Fascio reciting the poem.
There are many references of events of the era. Listen carefully for their cues. Poetical Offering Delivered upon the occasion of the gathering of the Wallingford and Meriden Granges at Spruce Glen, August 4th, 1910 by Nellie Paddock Cook Compliments of C.A. Kinney Many great events of interest are taking place this year. Things of interest to the borough and the Silver City near. In June, the greatest man since Caesar's time, they say, came home to these United States. We think he's come to stay. In aviation circles, the great event will take place soon, when they hope to cross the ocean in a dirigible balloon. And I must say, but not to them, for they'd be filled with wrath, that I expect that this will end in just a salt sea bath. The comet and its frisky tail was watched with bated breath, while the timid at one time were almost scared to death. The johnson Jeffries prize fight, which we deem an awful sin, but if a prize fight must take place, why couldn't the white man win? A new motor fire engine the Silver City has acquired. A thing of beauty, I am told, and very much admired. The school board of the city may, before the year is o'er, cease holding secret sessions, let the public in once more. But the great events of all to the patrons here today are the silver anniversaries, one in March and one in May. O oh, charter members of both towns, what successes you have won! Just gaze on these bright faces and see what you have done. We owe to you this happy day, I, this and many more. Two sister granges here unite, as they have done before. But never in a place like this, of beauty rich and rare. A place which lies in both our towns, that each may claim a share. And perhaps today goes down in the annals of the year, as the great event of all to the patrons gathered here. Thursday, the 4th of August, of the year 1910, when 29 and 33 did picnic in Spruce Glen. The hand of man has not defaced the works of nature here, while o'er his kingdom Kinney reigns, Spruce Glen has not to fear. He holds each tree as sacred as heavenward it looks. The woodman's axe shall not despoil these trees and shady nooks. O loving monarch of these woods, may your kingdom never fall. You love your farm, your animals, but Spruce Glen best of all. To save for old Connecticut is now your wise design, the wondrous beauties of Spruce Glen, of workmanship divine. And perhaps unnumbered people of another age and day will seek this place of beauty, here their cares will roll away. And in the future, as the past, it will be the rendezvous of happy lovers hand in hand who whisper, I love you. In loving benediction, stately trees will bend and sway, and tales of love beneath them told, they never give away. And if today I were a maid, young, though not fancy-free, and if among these picnickers I saw the man for me, I'd lead him to some leafy bower, where at my feet he'd drop, and in this romantic setting he could not help but pop. A word unto the wise, dear maids, is sufficient, so they say. So I trust you will improve the opportunities of the day. For when here a heart is lost, it is lost for good and all. For better or for worse, it is gone beyond recall. And perhaps the flowers that bloom here in profusion every spring will be used for decoration when your wedding bells shall ring. For not only is the glen the place where our beauties freely grows, but also lovely laurel, drooping ferns, and dogwood blows. And spruce glen flowers are in demand when nuptial knots are tied, and I am sure they always bring luck to the blushing bride. Within the precincts of the glen grows every kind of tree that thrives upon New England soil from mountaintop to sea. And peeping through the waterfall of glistening silvery sheen, are mosses of exquisite tints and shades of living green. 
and the laughing, gurgling waters, flowing pure and undefiled, link the burrow to its offspring, joins the parent and its child. The Indian wells to little feet have been a source of joy, and who would not be for this day a little barefoot boy? And then the bridge, the rustic bridge, which spans the silver stream, where many feet have passed and paused for this a place to dream. Here nature wafts her scented breath of cool, refreshing air, while one lingers, sweetly dreaming, loth to leave a place so fair. If for a souvenir of today you patrons are in quest, stand on this bridge, look present, and the camera does the rest. Carve your initials, if you will, if there is room for more, as some of your ancestors did in happy days of yore. On either side lie fields, once known as barren desolation, brought by the hand of man to a high state of cultivation, and owners of these lands could tell of stones and rocks they hurled. By these improvements they have left their mark upon the world. Tall hemlocks watching over all rise near a hundred feet, as they stretch upward, ever up the sun's bright ways to greet. Ere full maturity is reached, two hundred years go by. Perhaps the time seems long to them, for oft we hear them sigh. One day, at something seen, a rock was forced to crack a smile, from which cool waters flowed, and so it lingered for a while. Here many lips are pressed to drink, as yours may be today, and have no fear, for waters pure have washed all germs away. When the ice king throws his mantle o'er the trees and the ravine, no tongue or pen could half describe the beauty of the scene. And when the sun shines forth to kiss the treetops, then, ah, then, could heaven itself surpass the dazzling splendor of Spruce Glen. So let us get close to nature, in all her beauty shod, for if we are close to nature, then we are close to God. And may we often meet amidst the beauties of Spruce Glen, and now may God be with you till we meet here again. After years of having Grange meetings in members' homes, space was arranged at the Oddfellows Hall on Broad Street. They used the third floor for their meetings, which also had ample kitchen and dining facilities. Because Grange membership in Meriden was at its highest ab above 200, it was decided to acquire a plot of land and build their own Grange Hall. Meriden Grange Incorporate was formed in 1914 for that purpose, and by raising funds through grants and special events over 11 years, they met their monetary goals. Two years prior to the construction of their Grange Hall, a building committee was formed. In the photograph are Minor Ives of Diamond Hill Farm, Charles Greenbacker of Greenbacker Farms, and veterinarian Dr. Peter B. Brown. Doc Brown had offices a short ways down the, from Broad Street on East Main Street. Years later, Minor Ives continued with Grange at the state level and eventually became Connecticut State Grange Master. This was a do-it-yourself project on a massive scale, with the membership pitching in on acquiring property just across from the Oddfellows Hall, preparing the basement area using teams of horses and dredging shovels to prepare a half-basement area for Susio Trap Rock to provide foundation for the building. The building was quickly constructed in 1925. Here are some photos of the dredging operation in the spring of 1925. This first photo is a horse team with the dredging shovel. St. Rose Church, uh, ch uh, the spire showing in the left background. Next is a photo of Doc Brown uh, standing at the edge of the pit. Uh, there's a dredging shovel uh, uh, shown in the center with uh, a horse team off to the off to the right of the photo. Here's another overall photo of the construction site. In 
and several teams of horses uh, taking a rest nearby the pit. And of course, here's Doc Brown posing with the Ladies' Refreshment Committee of Meriden Grange. Here's a photo of the completed Meriden Grange Hall. This was a photo uh, photograph, or in this case, a postcard acquired on eBay. Note, uh, Broad Street was still a dirt road at the time, and a black pitching, uh, hitching post near the uh, street. A paved parking lot would come later. Meriden Grange Fair was started in 1925. This was determined from the collection of fair books found in the Grange Attic. The Meriden Grange Fair was actually started 90 years ago. The fair was not put on during World War II, which is why this is our 86th fair. In researching the fair premium books over the years, the list of premium contests and categories increased. For most of that time, we have maintained membership with the Association of Connecticut Fairs. This was formed in a major part by the local Grange Fairs at that time. A point of interest, by 1957, William H. Pomeroy, the son of J.T. Pomeroy, was the last surviving charter member. During his lifetime, he was a Republican alderman, state representative, and a member of the Board of Education. In 1945, he wrote a poem which described the events of 1885 and the ensuing years as a Meriden Grange member. More than 60 years ago, an address by Mortimer Whitehead was heard. My father became so enthused that strong hopes within him stirred. So Mr. Whitehead was secured and to all farmers made a call, inviting them to hear his talk in the old town hall. They, just, they all decide in its favor and wonder if they can arrange to meet at someone's home and organize a grange. At J.T. Pomeroy's house, they meet. Sherman Kimberly, the Grange, did organize. Our sisters said it won't last long. To them, it's been some surprise. In two years, the Grange grew so fast, the houses were too small. So they found a place to meet in the Odd Fellows Hall. From 1887 to 1923, we, were con we there continued to meet. Now we have our home across the street. As my mind wanders back, it almost seems strange to see the couples united since joining the Grange. The Grange has been a benefit to all on a farm or in town, for it is the best farm organization that has ever been found. It has been for the best, more ways than one, a benefit to each if all would come. So brothers and sisters, in closing tonight, as a member, I am thankful for its prospects are bright. W.H. Pomeroy. Now we're going to look at the past uh, 60 years uh, from the 1950s up until uh, present. We're going to talk. We're going to look at uh, dairy suppers, Grange floats, words for thirds, Connecticut Grange's State Grange 2009 CD music project, canned food drives, and rentals. In early 1960s, saw a number of dairy suppers held in conjunction with the Dairy Month in the state of Connecticut. Here's a picture of the youth and young at heart kitchen crew from one of those suppers in 1963. Note, our Golden Chief member, Phyllis Maines, in the photo on the right. Here are several shots of Meriden Grange ladies posing uh, on Grange floats for, uh, par uh, for a parade day. Here's another view of the same float and their escort.
between the 1960s and the new century found Meriden Grange having special events which ranged from military whist parties, suppers, and sponsored events. In 2003, we began a Words for Thirds project to supply 800 dictionaries to third graders in the elementary schools in Meriden. Seen here uh, was one of the f uh, few fundraising events we, were, we held, at, uh, and it was a supper and a mystery play supplied by the Castle Craig players. By the spring of 2004, we met our goal. In 2009, the Connecticut State Grange asked if we could host the Connecticut State Grange's sixth degree. This was held in October of that year in conjunction with the Connecticut State Grange delegate session. Attendees were bussed in from the hotel for this event. Next, we're going to talk about the National Grange Music CD Project in 2010. Meriden Grange created a project and proposed it to the National Grange to sell music CDs. The music created from the 1983 Grange Songbook. The purpose of creating the CD, whereby any community Grange would be able to have music during meetings if a pianist is not available, or to have the MP3 music available for reference for any budding Grange pianist. Since 2010, the completed CDs were sold through the National Grange Store. Since 2011, we've had several canned food drive events. In December of 2011 was a major canned food drive. Proceeds from this drive benefited one of the local soup kitchens in Meriden. Even though this was a Meriden Grange in corporate rental, this was a fun event and the new couple was very impressed with our hall and our assistance. I'm making no comments about, the other, about this other than that several children brought him up from the dining room area. Uh, and several gentlemen were whipping Sheriff Pickle all around the dance floor to everybody's enjoyment. If there's any non-members here in the audience, we are forwarding an invitation to anyone who maybe is interested in joining our Grange, young or old alike. Thank you for watching this video about the history of Meriden Grange.